Really, thank you. Maybe I'll go out and come back in again. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be back in Seattle. It's so wonderful and it's on such a day. And to hear so much about what's going on in your city. It's very exciting and very reassuring. And it's a uh, sign of what lucky people we are to live in such a great country. I'm um, I'm also, of course, extremely pleased and uh, complimented by the invitation to speak to so many who care about our public libraries and your own particular public library. Public libraries, in my judgment, as many agree, are one of the greatest of all of our American institutions. And we should must never, ever take them for granted. No other country has such a system whereby all the realms of learning, the whole reach of the human mind, and human history, and human experience is available to everybody in every imaginable kind of form, all for free. And imagine that anybody in this country could get a complete education, given some encouragement and some guidance by someone who has the advantage of hindsight and experience, could get a complete education for free in the public library just down the street. What a miracle that is. or your optimism seems to be in decline, just remember there are still more public libraries in our country than there are McDonald's. <laughs> I'm also very impressed by all the reports about your library. I hope to go there later this afternoon to see it for the first time. I'm told it's the most beautiful library in all of the United States of America. I've also been told that last winter here, it never snowed. <laughs> My wife Rosalie and I live in Boston. <laughs> we had a total accumulation in February of nine feet of snow. And I can tell you it was, it was a disaster. <laughs> and one blizzard followed another and just getting out of it, out and anywhere it was almost impossible to do. The subway system broke down. You weren't allowed to park cars on the streets. The snow was piled up so the sidewalks were tiny little narrow ditches between mountains of snow you couldn't even see over. And whenever there was a lull between blizzards, you'd go to the supermarket uh, to get provisions so you would survive the next round. And at uh, one point, one point we made up a list of all that we needed, and I said, I'll go bravely. And <laughs> off I went, and I was at the supermarket, and I found everything on the list except cashews. <laughs> and cashews are an essential of life. <laughs> so a fellow walked by with a star market label on his shirt, and I said, excuse me, could you tell me where the cashews are. He said, certainly follow me. So I followed him around a few turns. He pointed it out, I thanked him, and he left. Well, 10 or 15 minutes later, I was checking out at the cash register, and he came up to me, and he said, excuse me, that voice, <laughs> your voice, have I heard that voice on television? And I said, there's Yes, there's a very good chance you have. And he said, he said uh, were you the voice, the narrator of the Ken Burns Civil War series? I said, yes, I was. He said, well, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, because back at the time that that series came on the air, I was suffering terribly from insomnia. <laughs> that 
side effect on any event. My other favorite moment of sort of being grounded again is that Rosie and I were arriving uh, at, at Philadelphia in a fine hotel there we'd driven to, for the, the day, the speaking day. And uh, we pulled up and there was a big handsome doorman with a magnificent uniform on, opened the door for Rosalie, and uh, I popped the button for the trunk and got out of my side, the driver's side, came around back up onto the sidewalk, and he had taken the bags out of the trunk and just was setting them down on the pavement. And he straightened up and he looked and he said, Mr. McCullough, welcome to our hotel, welcome to Philadelphia, how good to have you here. I said, well, thank you very much. I'm always very interested if somebody I don't know says something, how they know who I am. So I said, that, that's a, such a warm greeting and I greatly appreciate it, but if you don't mind my asking, how do you know who I am? He said, the tag on your suitcase. <laughs> is that very little of consequence is ever accomplished alone. It's something that people in Washington need to be reminded of. You, every, every high accomplishment is always a genius. And that's so true of writing a book of the kind that I write, biography history. Without librarians, without archivists, without specialists in one's a uh, category of information that I need to know more about or another, I could not do what I do. Not to mention the immense help from editors, art directors, book designers, and uh, people who happen to know something that want to tell me about it, and members of my own family. But there's no one who has meant more to me over my writing career, which began 50 years ago, this year I signed my first contract with Simon Schuster. No one has been more helpful, more, in, more of an inspiration, more of a, uh, uh, an aid to navigation than my editor-in-chief, who's also my wife, Rosalie. We have five children. 19 grandchildren, and she's mission control. A whole lot of us. And Secretary of the Treasury, and Chair of the Ethics Committee. And my polar star that I steer by, Rosalie, where are you? Where are you? Here she is. I'm very often asked where my ideas come from, or how do I get the notion of one particular book or another to get going on it. And I thought I would give, give you an example right from my current book, The Wright Brothers, which had, occurs at the very end of the book. But in fact, it was the beginning for me. And I'm so glad that it worked out the way it did. I very seldom have enjoyed working on a book as much as I have this one. The, um, the, the scene is given to us by the American novelist, brilliant American novelist, Edith Wharton. Now what happened was I was writing, my, working on my last book, uh, which about, was about Americans in Paris, Americans who went there to perfect themselves in their chosen profession or career, whether it was medicine or art or sculpture or architecture or writing. And I was reading into the lives of a great variety of people in all disciplines. And one of them, of course, uh, was in the, the field of great American fiction, literature, and one of the key characters who lived in Paris early in the 20th century was Edith Wharton. And she um, wrote a letter to a friend with the following
following description. And when I read that account, I thought, whoa, think of it. She was stepping out of her chauffeur-driven limousine uh, at the front entrance of the Hotel de Crillon on the Place de la Concorde. And she noticed several people looking into the sky. And as she recounted in a letter to her friend, and what do you think happened to me last Monday? I was getting out of the motor car at the door of the Hotel de Crillon when I saw two or three people looking into the air. I looked also, and there was an airplane high up against the sky and emerging on the Place de la Concorde. It sailed obliquely across the Place, incredibly high above the obelisk, against a golden sunset with a new moon between flitting clouds and crossing the Seine in the direction of the Pantheon, lost itself in a flight of birds that was crossing the sky, then reappeared far off, a speck against the clouds, and disappeared at last into the twilight. And it was the Comte de Lambert in a right biplane who had just flown across from Juvisy. And it was the first time that an airplane has ever crossed the great city. Think what a soul was mine, and what a setting in which to see one's first airplane flight. Now the Comte de Lambert, I soon learned, was a French aviator who had learned to fly as a student of Wilbur Wright's. And I subsequently learned that Wilbur Wright himself had spent almost a year in France, and that his brother Orville had also come and gone to France several times, and his sister Catherine. And I was astonished, not just by what Edith Wharton wrote, and I also subsequently learned that was the first time any airplane had ever flown over any city in the world. Also, as she did not relate in her account, that Comte de Lambert in this right biplane had flown over the Eiffel Tower, which means he was flying at, at, at least an altitude of 1,400 feet, which no plane had ever attained or dared before. So you have a French pilot sailing over the Champs-Élysées, sailing over the Eiffel Tower in an American-built American plane, being witnessed by one of the greatest writers of that era, and, and moving her to the depths of her emotional self. What a, what a combination. And then I began to read more about the Wright brothers. First of all, I wondered, what are they doing in France? They're meant to be back in, in their bicycle shop in Ohio. All that I really knew about the Wright brothers at that point was that they had a bicycle shop in Dayton, Ohio, and they invented the airplane. That's about all we learned in high school for the 10 minutes or less that they devoted to the subject. Yet, yet imagine what that one scene witnessed by Edith Wharton indicated about what was to come. The world had been changed and would be changed even more and dramatically by that one single invention. And then to find out that they had come to France, Wilbur Wright, in the first stages of it, because no one back home would take their accomplishments seriously. The newspapers, the federal government, was completely ignoring them, all to the point of insulting them. They were laughed at as a couple of wackos. The press in Dayton, Ohio itself, wouldn't even come the eight miles out of town to the test ground of cow pasture that the Wright brothers were using for their test place. And asked some years later by one of the editors of the Daily Papers in Dayton, how in the world could you have not done that? It was all happening right under your noses. He said, I guess we were just plain stupid. <laughs> and they were as was our government. Now one of the reasons for that is that Samuel Langley, one of the most brilliant American scientists of that era,